Hello, hello, hello. It's not working. Hello. Test, test. Now it's working. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is my last lecture already. Um, time goes fast. Um, so what I want to do today is to um, discuss gauge supergravities and the black holes that arise. Of course, this is a whole topic by itself. And so I want to maybe be a little bit sketchy, but sketchy, I was also a little bit sketchy perhaps yesterday. Um, and the whole point also of this lecture is to, is to prepare for uh, uh, future lectures, in particular Alberto uh, and, uh, and Samir, perhaps also Joao. Um, and so um, I'm not going to give like a full analysis of gauge supergravities, but I want to discuss a little bit what are the main ingredients of such a theory, how does it look like, and, um, uh, and, uh, and then in a concrete example, uh, discuss particular, uh, uh, discuss BPS black hole solutions. So the whole, uh, um, that sets the stage a little bit. So we're interested in black hole solutions that uh, are not living in asymptotically flat space. This I did yesterday. But I'm interested, we're interested in solutions, black hole solutions that are asymptotically living in, in ADS. We have seen, uh, in ADS4, we have seen that um, that if you just do uh, uh, the simplest version of supergravity in ADS, that was just with no matter couplings, then um, uh, it's essentially the rational nerve term living in ADS4. That could not be made supersymmetric without having naked singularities. And so we need to do something. In fact, um, the analysis was also done uh, I think in 1999, uh, uh, James Liu, where is he? I think a, a famous paper by Duff and Liu, um, where uh, one studies n equals eight gauge supergravities. And so if you focus there also on electric, uh, uh, electrically charged black holes, that doesn't do the job either in the sense that uh, these solutions become uh, naked singularities. But that paper will still be relevant also for a later discussion because there's a lot of embedding of um, four-dimensional supergravity into M-theory uh, and then eventually you want to make connections with uh, um, ABGM theory and explain the entropy of black holes uh, microscopically using field theory techniques. But that's not the purpose of uh, my lectures. So. Um, what is gauge supergravities? So, well, yesterday I brought you to the point where I discussed matter couplings to n equals 2 supergravity. And so I'm going to leave out the hypermultiplets for the moment and just discuss vector multiplets. And if you do all the gauge fixing, for the present purposes, the off-shell version is not very relevant for us. I'm interested in constructing black hole solutions, just equation of motion, no fluctuations or localization around it. So I'm just interested in constructing solutions. So that is just a, an, a, an on-shell procedure is, is good enough for that. And after you do all the conformal calculus, you end up with supergravity theories for vector multiplets, um, which are of the following uh, type. So there's the Einstein-Hilbert term, and then we had vector multiplets, and in each vector multiplets there is a complex scalar, and then there is, I didn't write that down yesterday, but today I will uh, write down the kinetic energy or, or the kinetic terms for the gauge fields. Let me first write it down and then say a few words about it. In fact, I wrote down one particular model yesterday on the, explicitly on the blackboard where I had one complex scalar and I had um, two vectors. So 
I runs over the number of vector multiplets, and this index lambda, which I called I yesterday, capital I, um, now I call, I call lambda, lambda sigma. Um, so I runs from 1 to nv, and lambda runs from 1 to nv plus 1. The reason why there is an additional vector is because there is the gravy photon. The gravy photon is part of the Poincaré multiplet together with the metric. And uh, of course, there's also fermionic terms that I'm not writing down. And so here we see the kinetic energy for the scalar fields in the vector multiplets. There is a, a, a metric on, the, on that uh, space. It's called special scalar metric. And I gave an explicit example yesterday where I only had one scalar and this thing was just one divided by imaginary part of z squared. And here we have the um, um, kinetic terms for the, um, for the gauge field. And this I is a matrix uh, or that uh, also depends on the scalar fields. I wrote down an example yesterday. Uh, then this was just the imaginary part of Z, and this was the real part of Z, but in general this is now a, a, a matrix. This would be theta angle-like terms, and um, all these quantities here have geometric interpretations in terms of special scalar geometry, but for the present purposes, the only thing that we need to know is that all these three quantities here are determined by a prepotential uh, f of x, and these x's then can be parameterized by uh, um, coordinate z. Um, the reason is that uh, yesterday I wrote down these kind of these kind of constraints. Let's say this constant. So nij was made out of the second derivatives of f. And so this is a constraint on all the fields. So the solution of this is a hypersurface, which has co-dimension 1. And, um, um, and coordinates on that surface are the small z's. So, and these z's end up being here. Other way of saying this is you do the superconformal quotient from the uh, off-shell formulation to the on-shell formulation, and then you, exchange, you change the x's for the z's. You go down in one complex dimensions. So this is just one constraint. There's also the u1 constraint that allows you to um, go down. I'll give explicit examples. So uh, important examples that are relevant kind of for our discussion is this model here. Let's say you have four vector multiplets, or three in the um, four vectors and three scalars. So this is a, a, now, a known example. It's the STU model, essentially. Or you can also go to um, another example of a prepotential is, that is often studied is this one here. It had to be homogeneous of second degree. Both of them are homogeneous of second degree. And in fact, for those who know this, these two prepotentials are related by electromagnetic uh, duality. Um, sometimes one makes truncations. You set certain fields uh, equal to each other. If you're off-shell, you can easily do that. And so for the purpose of my uh, uh, talk here, I will, I, will look, uh, I will look at the case where number one, two, and three are really the same. And so I'm going to study this particular model, um, which is x0 and x1 cubed. It's still homogeneous degree. So of course, now I have only um, um, two vectors, vector multiplets. And uh, I can do the same thing here. You can have f equals x1 cubed over x0. So that's uh, kind of um, the choice of this prepotential basically dictates and determines this entire Lagrangian. So um, we have also Gravitini here and, and, uh, and the gay genie. And so a natural question that comes to your mind is, hey, we have, we have gauge fields, but nothing seems to be charged under the gauge fields. All the fields are neutral. Uh, the scalar fields this is just a flat derivative. There's no, there's no connection here involving this. And if you write down the kinetic terms for the Gravitino or the Gagino, they're also not charged. They're neutral. So um, the question then is, well, can we make some of these fields charged under the, U, under the U1s that I have available here? 
And the answer is yes. And in essence, that is what gauge supergravity is. You're charging certain fields under vector fields, under, under gauge fields, that are already available in, uh, in the multiplets that you have. And there's different choices that you can make. Uh, you can make different fields uh, charge under these U1s. For instance, I can make these scalar fields uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be charged under the U1s. Uh, but there's also, I will do that maybe when there's time left over. But inside the fermions, there's a gravitini. I can also make the fermions charge under the U1s. And that's a different choice. And there are different types of gaugings that you can do. I didn't write down the hypermultiplet. They also have scalars, and I can gauge them. I can give them charge. And so the gauging that I will look at most of this lecture today is um, gauge, give, or gauge the gravitini. I have two of them. Give them charge, in other words. Yeah. Now, um, the way you do that is just by using the ordinary uh, uh, procedure of gauging. You just covariantize derivatives, and you you couple the fermions to the gauge field by minimal coupling, and that uh, works here as well. At least um, that's part of the procedure. But now you see that we have we have many gauge fields, and I can take the gravitini. Um, and I can give them charge under any of these gauge fields. And so, or the most general uh, uh, thing I can do is to take a linear combination with arbitrary parameters and um, take that gauge field and charge it uh, uh, and use it to charge the gravitini. So, so use the combination. psi lambda, a mu lambda, to do this. Where psi lambda are arbitrary parameters they're called, in this context, they are called uh, Faye-Iliopoulos terms. Actually, I'm not doing this in the canonical way. If you read the textbook on gauge supergravity, you won't hear the presentation in this way. Um, you, you, you'll start reading about potentials and superpotentials and then terms in there. I, 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 I always refuse to do it in the canonical way, so I think of my own way. And so uh, you will see later what is the connection to terms and the potential. So I can pick a, a general combination, and I call them parameters, and whether they are called phi Leopoldus terms or not. Uh, is not very relevant. I pick a combination. I use that gauge field to charge the gravitini. And if you want to use a different, you can just adapt the, the, the choice of these parameters. You can set some of them to 0 and, and others to 1. Then you just make a particular choice which gauge field that you are using to charge the gravitini. Now, once you do that, um, then what you have to do is um, change the, um, the kinetic, uh, the covariant derivative. You have to change the covariant derivative and add, of course, a term. Well, there's the ordinary derivative, then there's the spin connection. I don't write down all these terms here. I just write the additional terms that are used uh, in this. And here's my gauge field, at least the combination of it. And then if you go through the details, um, you also find that you have to the, uh, the, there's two gravitini, and they have opposite charge. That's why there is a sigma 3. And um, so this is a standard term that arises when you gauge, uh, when you give the gravitini charge. This is also sometimes called gauging the R symmetry. I don't like the, to use that terminology that much, but um, well, whatever. It's not, not very important. Um, good. So um, this is what you do. This is, this is called an electric gauging because the electric charges of the gravitino are equal to g times psi lambda. These are the electric charges. Well, I have two of them. I have plus or minus e lambda because the plus sits in one eigenvalue here and the minus in the other one. And so uh, these are the electric charges of the uh, gravitino. 
Gravitini. And so, of course, we're going to be looking for black hole solutions. And these black holes turn out to have magnetic charges. So not electric charges. The electric charges that has been tried before, they always turn out to have, uh, I don't know if this is really a theorem that holds in the most general uh, uh, class of gauge supergravities, uh, but um, electrically charged black holes will uh, not appear here. So now we have a situation where we have electrically charged particles and we have a magnetically charged black hole. And so you can go through the usual uh, Dirac arguments for the quantization of charges. And so if you have a magnetically charged object somewhere uh, and an electrically charged particle here, uh, the Dirac quantization condition in the conventions that we're using is something like E lambda, P lambda is an integer. And um, Uh, in fact, you can also do something more, uh, slightly more complicated, and it, in fact it is done in the literature, and it's also important in the black hole story. You can also do magnetic gaugings, and you can do magnetic gaugings <laughs> by introducing magnetic gauge fields and, uh, and parameters. Uh, this is just a side remark. to make you realize that there exists such a thing as magnetically charged um, um, gauge supergravities. So with magnetic gaugings, there's quite a bit of technology to understand from the supergravity point of view what these magnetic uh, gaugings, how they look like, how that works. But you will get something like uh, um, combinations of gauge fields where these are the magnetic gauge fields. There are different gauge fields from these ones. They are the magnetic, the, the magnetic ones. So let me put a tilde here. And these are new parameters here, the magnetic uh, uh, phi Leopold's terms, if you want. And so you can use gauge fields like this. You have to double the amount of gauge fields, if you want. And uh, then you can make gravitinis that have both electric and magnetic charge. And then if you go through the black hole, uh, with magnetically gauge, with magnetic gaugings, you can also make black holes to be both charged under electric and magnetic charges. But if you're an electric frame, then um, then the gravitino are electrically charged and the black hole is magnetically charged. That's the only possibility if you have if you impose uh, supersymmetry. Yes. Yeah, 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 I have to complete that argument. This was just a, a side remark. So the, the, the first step in the procedure is what we always do when we make symmetries local. We gauge something and you do the, um, um, uh, of course, then, then the, the, the gauge transformations come into the game. And the gauge transformations, they form certain commutation relations with supersymmetry. And so it turns out if you want to obey the supersymmetry algebra, you also have to change the supersymmetry transformations. And for instance, the, this would be a magnetic gauge field. It's it's. Um, yes, you can make it part. Uh, if I introduce some more uh, uh, indices, so so suppose this this lambda, I have to let it run for right from the start over over twice the amount of, of values. Then half of them um, I consider to be electric ones, and half of them there's a, there's a. <laughs> People who know me a bit better. Uh, um, uh, and, um, uh, and the other one are, are going to be the magnetic gauge fields. Of course, everything is subject to electromagnetic uh, uh, duality transformations. So you can sometimes can go to a frame where it's purely electric or purely magnetic or something in between. And this in between uh, leads then to combinations of this type once I start doing the gauging. Yeah. Yeah. I 
Well, in an ungauge theory, you don't see the difference that much because you can always do rotations and, and it is semantics, what you call uh, um, uh, electric and magnetic. Um, and um, uh, well, here, of course, with the gauging, that, that makes a little bit, uh, that, that makes the theory different. And so, um, well, you, you, the field strengths will look differently uh, for the electric and the magnetic potentials, et cetera. I'm going to explain it more in detail perhaps uh, uh, later. I'm not going to use the magnetic gauging. I just want to mention this, but I suspect that maybe Alberto will use them. Oh, no, you won't. Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It just looks a bit strange that you have both of them in the same local Lagrangian. Yes, well, uh, that's why I precisely introduced new fields. Uh, you cannot have that for, with the same field. There's a whole formalism to it, and uh, well, this is going to lead to a, a, a compli too complicated discussion. Uh, you cannot do that. That's why this is an A tilde. If you would, if you would, if you'd really introduce one gate, you, you cannot do that locally. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's also some, some choice of symplectic form when you write it like this, so, so that surface. Yeah. I'm afraid I can only explain this well if I take uh, half an hour, and uh, I, 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 don't, I don't really want to do that. Uh, but uh, it, it is important if you want to discuss black holes that are dionic, uh, um, but I'm not going to do this here. It's in the book. No, 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 this is not in the book anymore. Uh, so this is, um, um, so the, the solutions that I'm going to discuss today are basically found by, well, there's three papers. It started with uh, Cacciatore Clem, uh, and then um, uh, Nyeki and Dalagata um, wrote a paper, especially also about the magnetic gaugings, and then Kirill Christoph, who arrived today, and myself, we uh, also um, um, constructed these solutions and embedded them in M-theory, uh, computed the masses and, uh, um, and stuff like that, and the entropy. Um, very good. Um, these, all these three papers are closely related, and uh, uh, Cacciatore Clem was the first, uh, the first paper. Can you gauge yeah. more than you want? Excuse me? Can you gauge more than you want? Um, you, you, you mean like non-abelian groups? Yes, this you can do. That also becomes a story by itself. Like, w what is the story about black hole physics uh, uh, when there's non-abelian uh, gauge fields present? That's already a complicated story when you just do gravity and young mills theory um, i don't know what the state of the art is in this but there are numerical solutions where uh, uh, where this works but it, it's it, it, it's all you run into problems with the no hair theorem because a black hole cannot have non-abelian uh, charges uh, that's forbidden by the non uh, no so the question is then what do the non-abelian sectors really do uh, on the other hand uh, well Black holes presumably are constructed by the standard model particles. So, um, yeah, I can give you. Uh, here, this is. I, I'm only going to consider abelian charges uh, um, of this type. But there is there is literature about uh, um, also in supergravity about non-abelian. Uh, but the story becomes much more complicated. This is already complicated. Are there any more questions? Right, so um, forget about the magnetic gaugings. We won't do it. So when you do this here, you also have to adapt the supersymmetry uh, transformation rules. And so what you have to do is a few things, but I'll focus on the gravitino. Um, so this is d mu epsilon i. It involves a spin connection. There are some other fields that are already present in the ungauged theory. And then there is a modification of the following type sigma 3, i, j, psi lambda, l lambda, uh, and then gamma mu, epsilon uh, j. So what do we see here? Uh, there's one new symbol here. L lambda is, by definition, e to the k over 2 times x lambda. k is the Kähler potential of which this is the special Kähler metric here. And so you deform also the supersymmetry transformation rules. If you don't, your algebra doesn't work anymore uh, as a consequence of this uh, modification here. 
And well, now you've met, now you've changed the, well, I've changed the action, I've changed the supersymmetry, well, I have to recheck whether my action is invariant. And the answer is the action is no longer invariant, but you can make it invariant if you also add a potential. And the potential uh, looks as full. I'm just going to write it down, what the potential looks like. And um, of course, all these things were derived with, well, a lot of effort. Um, there were basically two schools, or there are two schools on, on, on gauge supergravities. Um, perhaps one is the sort of like Belgian Dutch school, uh, De Witt and Van, and De Witt and, and Van Puyen. Uh, and then the, the, Italian, uh, the Italian school that started with Ferrara, Doria, Frey, and, and many other people. There's lots of references. Uh, many people in the audience have worked also on this. And so um, I'm just going to write down what is the result. The result is that you have to also add a potential to um, uh, the theory. And that potential um, looks as follows. G i j bar. Let me first write it down. OK, here's the potential. Well, it's good that there is a potential, because if we ever want to have uh, ADS, black holes in ADS, there better be a potential that generates a cosmological constant. So um, I have not explained all the symbols here. Here are the faye Heliopolis terms. Here are these Ls. They are essentially the sections uh, xi uh, multiplied by the Kähler potential. Here's the inverse metric, gij. And then there's this f. This f is defined. Where can I write it? Perhaps here. F i lambda equals e to the k over 2 d i x uh, lambda, uh, lambda, lambda. And this d i is the derivative with respect to z, the coordinate over here. The axes depend on the z. And you have to covariantize this with, uh, uh, so, right equals e to the k over 2 di plus the Kähler potential acting on x lambda. I hope you can still read this. There's a lot of definitions and abbreviations. All these objects have geometrical interpretations, uh, uh, but I won't have time to explain all the beauty of the special uh, geometry. So now the model is completely defined here. This is my action. Uh, that's still true in the bosonic case. Nothing has changed because this we left uncharged. So the only modifications to the Lagrangian arise because of these kind of terms and because a potential needs to be added. And if you add the potential, then you can check that the whole thing is invariant on the local n equals 2 supersymmetry. So now we can um, discuss uh, black hole solutions. So, so that is my short resume of gauge supergravity. Um, and one can make that more complicated. Uh, if I have time left over, I will say a few things by also gauging uh, these scalars or adding hypermultiplets. And, uh, um, uh, and if you do that, there are still the same procedures. You make derivatives covariant. Uh, you change the supersymmetry rules. And you add more terms to the potential. And that's all uh, well understood and well under control. Good. I want to stick to this particular theory with the Faye-Leopolis terms. This is also called Faye-Leopolis gaugings. And construct uh, black hole solutions, because these were the first models where uh, uh, BPS solutions were uh, written down. And they preserved not half of the supersymmetries, but only one quarter. One quarter out of eight means two supercharges. And um, So that is something uh, slightly particular, because that doesn't happen in asymptotically flat space. There it's always 1 half. And 1 half out of 8 is 4 supercharges in n equals 2. So the models, the example, that was the first example of a BPS black hole in ADS4 with a regular horizon, no naked singularity. Um, is the one quarter BPS solution, black hole, with 
nv equals 1. You, you can easily generalize that. And so one vector multiplet besides the gravity photon and f to be the, poten the prepotential I wrote down before. You can easily extend this by taking four vector multiplets and just write here x1, x2, x3, x4. Probably that's also what Alberto will be doing, so keep that in mind. I just do it here for having simplified notation. So basically what I'm doing is I will set some charges equal to each other. Uh, uh, and so that's a truncated version from the version that you will uh, get, um, that you will see in Alberto's talk. So um, to make very explicit here what this coordinate z is, in this case, the coordinate z is simply given by x1 over x0. So this is the relation how the um, <coughs> z coordinate uh, arises as um, often you also see x1 is 0, is z, and x0 equals 1. Not always is the coordinate z uh, found in this way or given in this way. There's choices. You can do different symplectic parameterizations. Um, but this is a particular choice that I will use. So before you write down the black hole solution, you have to um, um, find the minima of this potential or the extrema of this potential and find that there is an ADS vacuum. Because if there's no ADS vacuum, there's no point in finding a black hole solution. But the, that's rather easy. And so first you find an ADS4 vacuum. So um, how does that work? So you have the prepotential. So you can construct all these quantities here, L and F, that's all dictated by the prepotential. And you can just write out this potential in all its gory detail. It's a function of z and z bar and these size. And you just extremize it and you find uh, an ADS vacuum for a constant scalar, z star equals 3 xi 0, xi 1. And then the value of the potential at this extrema is the cosmological constant, and it's given by minus 2 g squared. There has to be a, well, there's a g squared here, or I can also put it in front of g. That's, that's the coupling constant, right? Uh, minus 2 g squared over square root of 3, xi 0, xi 1 cubed. And if you want to go to the model that has four vector multiplets, you just write here xi 1, xi 2, and xi 3. So this is an ADS vacuum. It preserves all the supersymmetries. And so that's, that's step, step number one. Then um, we're going to find uh, or write down the black hole uh, solution. It's going to be uh, magnetically charged. Yes, there's a question. A. K, K. Oh, K, K is the Kähler potential. So the Kähler potential, um, so I wrote down this metric here, G i j bar. That's, of course, the Kähler potential of the special Kähler geometry. And then, this, this, and then the question is, how do you construct this out of the prepotential? There is a formula that goes something like this, maybe up to factors of i's and minus, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, minus x bar lambda f uh, lambda. So this is a function of z and z bar. I don't think I wrote down this formula yesterday, so. <coughs> OK, so we're going to look for uh, magnetically charged black holes because the attempts to find electrically charged black hole had uh, sort of failed um, because they produce naked singularities, at least when you do an electric gauging. Uh, and so we're going to look for, we're going to make an ansatz in which the, um, in which there is no electric field. And so the ansatz um, so the black hole Well, first you write the metric in a particular ansatz. You write this here. The S squared equals, yeah, we use also conventions in a, in a, in a plus, minus, minus, minus metric. Forgive me. It's Kirill's fault. But 
he was very good at computing with this signature, I mean. Um, um, so we make the ansatz here, I'll specify, uh, and we make the ansatz that there's no electric field and the magnetic field theta phi lambda equals p lambda over 2 sine theta. And so we have two magnetic charges here. Lambda runs over 1 and 2. There's a 0 and a 1. So we have magnetic charges p0 and p1. These are the two magnetic charges. There's no electric charges because I put it in there. And then essentially you turn the crank uh, and you find that, uh, well, how explicit should I be? Um, u of r is equal to e to the k over 2 g r plus some constant that I will specify in a moment. H of r is given by r e to the minus k over 2. So these are the functions that you plug in here, u and h. It's again determined in terms of the um, scalar potential, so you have to know what is the value for the scalar field. And the scalar fields are given by harmonic function x0 equals alpha 0 plus beta 0 over r and x1 is alpha 1 plus beta 1 over r. And so, um, so we have a bunch of constants here, namely alpha 0, beta 0, alpha 1, beta 1, and we have this constant c. They are all, if you work out the, the BPS conditions, they are all determined by the two Faye Heliopoulos terms and the two magnetic charges. So they are all, so alpha, beta, and this coefficient c, they're all determined by xi lambda, xi zero and xi one, and p zero and p one. I didn't write down the explicit expressions here, but they're in, uh, in the papers that I uh, quoted. OK, so um, that's it. Everything is specified here. Well, to make it very concrete, you have to plug in some value because you have to compute the Kähler potential. You have to find the coefficient c here, but uh, I have not given the formula. Uh, it, it's crucial to have a horizon because uh, the, 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 f the c should be negative, because if c is not negative, you will never find a zero of, of, uh, uh, of this, and then there will be no horizon. But things work out in the way that c is negative, and if c is negative, then everybody can solve this, uh, find a zero of this uh, equation. Then you find the value of the horizon, and uh, the value of the horizon, or the location of the horizon, is given by r horizon equals, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a rather complicated formula. Well, rather, in some sense, the easiest way to write it, we found, was um, minus 2g squared. But I still have to eliminate this beta in terms of the uh, phi Heliopoulos terms and the charges. And then you get a. Um, value for the horizon. And with the horizon, you can compute, uh, compute the entropy. And s equals a over 4. Um, I think Alberto will also write that formula in a more elegant way. So you can plug it in. Uh, by, you have to be, it's a little bit subtle because you have to compute the function h at the value of the horizon because, and that you have to integrate. So it's not just rh squared. Yeah, it's h squared at the horizon squared and that multiplied by 4 pi. And so um, that's, um, so that is the, that is the result. Um, um, some remarks. Well, the near horizon geometry, just like for asymptotically flat black holes, is again given by an ADS2 cross S2 factor. 
near horizon. That's of course very important that we have uh, in the infrared also conformal symmetry dictated by the ADS2 factor. The only difference with uh, uh, um, asymptotically flat space uh, time uh, is that the radii of, uh, of these two spaces are not equal to each other, but that doesn't bother us too much. So uh, another remark is that we can also construct I mentioned this very quickly, in, uh, uh, that we can construct a black hole with an electric and a magnetic charge, not in the theory and in the gauging that I wrote down, um, with, let's say, uh, a, mag a magnetic charge with respect to the first gauge field and an electric charge with respect to the second. Um, but then you have to um, use electromagnetic uh, or symplectic transformations. I didn't explain that well, but apparently it's also not going to be needed. What you do then is you have to act with that on the full theory. Then also the prepotential that's not invariant under these transformations, if you choose. So F equals to x1 cubed over x0. Then, of course, also the gravitini are going to have different charges. They're going to have one electric charge and one magnetic charge. Can you explain uh, the fact that in, when you engage supergravity, you cannot, there's no invariance on the disimplectic transformation? Because I, is, is, is there some object that I can see this is the attraction? Um, there's, there's covariance, but not invariance. Um, Well, I, I wrote down the potential, for instance, uh, and this potential has phi a Heliopolis term. And so that is not in very, these, these phi a Heliopolis terms, they, they, they also have some index lambda, if you want. And on that index lambda, electromagnetic duality transformation or symplectic transformations, they act on anything that has a lambda index. But then you see already that there is a, there is a, its partner is missing. So we have symplectic pairs. This is a little bit of an aside x lambda and f lambda. This is a symplectic pair. But also the phi Heliopolis terms, xi lambda, um, there will be xi lambda and xi lambda. And these will, these will generate electric gaugings, and these will uh, generate uh, magnetic gaugings. And so um, one of them was missing. Uh, I only had, in, in my potential, I only had, since I was doing an electric gauging, the other one was not there. And so the theory is not invariant under these transformations. There's many ways of saying the same thing. Also, the kinetic terms for the scalar fields without gauging, it's not invariant. It's only invariant if you also change the prepotential. Therefore, it's not invariant. Uh, but it has some covariance uh, properties if you also change the prepotential. Then the Lagrangian state has still the same form, except that you have to change, uh, take a different uh, expression for the prepotential. So in the potential, you clearly see that some terms are missing. And in fact, if you, people constructed the magnetic gaugings uh, in a way such that these covariance properties become um, um, become, uh, well, I actually have the expression on, 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 on the next uh, slide. Um, this is like Kähler transformations in post <coughs> No, it's not Kähler transformations. It's electromagnetic transformations. Um, so you basically rotate also. So, um, so another symplectic pair is F mu nu lambda. And then we have G mu nu lambda, which you can think of as the magnetic field strength. Um, <coughs> Think of it as just the star of F. And so symplectic transformations also act on this pair. And so there you see that you're basically changing electric and magnetic fields. So that's, that's the way to think of it physically. Yes? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. That's right. The near horizon geometry is a supersymmetric solution Yes, it's a supersymmetric solution by its own. And I think um, 
can you help me if I'm wrong? But I think if you just the near horizon solution is is again maximum is is sorry has augmented supersymmetry and that is one half BPS. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 So so that we've seen also in flat space. So uh, if you have a black hole asymptotically flat space, maximal supersymmetry, then along the way to the horizon you break half of it, but at the horizon you have again maximal uh, supersymmetry. With ADS, it's a little bit different. There, at, at asymptotically flat space, you have maximal supersymmetry. Along the flow, it has one quarter, and at the horizon, it is BPS, but it's one half. Not, not maximal, but one half. Uh, very good. Yes? Uh, can you speak a bit louder? If I just look at the solution. Yes. Yes, yes, and there's also an attractor mechanism going on. It's a little bit more uh, complicated, but in this example, it's very easy because we see that z, the coordinate z, is the ratio of this two, and it's the same story since b. Well, now, uh, uh, now the, the the attractor mechanism and the no-hair theorem says that the black hole horizon uh, should be determined in terms of the charges only. And this is going to be the charges of the black hole, but also the Fayet Heliopolis terms. But these are charges because they are electric charges of the uh, of the Gravitini. And so there's an attractor equation as well. The only thing you have to be careful with is that if there is flat directions in your potential, there are some scalar fields that don't see the black hole. Those, of course, are not fixed by attractor. They're, they're just uh, you can set them to constant at any constant. Very good. Um, there's an M-theory lift. That's important, of course. Um, that's important um, to make the connection with ADS-CFT. So the story is that um, this can be embedded by uh, in M theory, uh, using the spherical compactification. Of course, you get a more complicated n equals eight supergravity. The details are in the Duff new paper, um, already from uh, 99, I think, huh? Yeah, so, or something like that. Um, that is you, huh? Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that is you, you. Yes, yeah, yeah. So Very good. Um, so the details of it uh, are important for uh, making contact with ADS-CFT. And so here you get, of course, SO8 gaugings. Here you see an example where you have non-abelian gauging. But what you do is you make a constructed black hole. Uh, the SO8 has a carton, which is U1 to the fourth. There you see your four vector multiplets coming out. All the non-abelian stuff you, you, you truncate, or that, that, by this I mean you construct a black hole solution that's only charged with respect to the U1 to the fourth, and so you will get uh, charges P0, P1, P2, and P3. Um, and, um, um, well, of course I would need to write it out and exactly go through the truncation, but uh, I won't have time uh, for that. Um, very good. So. Let me just mention, since I have 10 minutes uh, uh, still time, about uh, the, the broader class of gaugings, uh, such that you get a little bit of a, uh, uh, a total overview. So after the Cacciatore Clem uh, and our papers, um, people investigated extensions, generalizations, um, to include also hypermultiplets or other gaugings. And um, that is still very much ongoing. There are some results. Some of them are numerical. Many people in the audience here have worked on it. I'm not going to give all the names, but um, um, and sometimes people could also only construct the near horizon solution, so the ADS2 crosses two solutions. Uh, and in only very particular cases, one could find analytic solutions uh, where more general gaugings were considered. So let me say a few words, because I still have 10 minutes, about these more uh, complicated gaugings. So, so we can also, so one was a gauging of the Gravitini, or called, also called R symmetry gauging. And so we can gauge 
gauge the or charge the vector multiplet scalars. And so, well, for this, every time you gauge something, you must have a global symmetry first. Now, the scalar fields in the Lagrangian have the following form, kinetic term. So you must have a, a global symmetry first, but here you have a nonlinear sigma model. So that means that this, this, you, you will never have a global symmetry if there is no killing vectors or symmetries associated to this metric. So you need what is called a killing, uh, a killing vector and, or, or a bunch of killing vectors. And then you can have a global gauge symmetry acting on the scalar fields alpha lambda k lambda i, which is a function of z. And these are killing vectors. vectors of, of the metric gij bar. So they satisfy the killing equation. Once you have this, you have a, a global symmetry. You can gauge it. And so you change d mu zi into d mu, a covariant derivative, which is just a, And of course, there is a, 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 well, the gauge transformation. Now, that is a covariant. And so uh, you've gauged this uh, symmetry. Uh, but uh, that doesn't, that's not enough. You have to also change the supersymmetry transformation rules. And you also have to then change the potential. I will write down the potential uh, uh, in a moment. Because, uh, well, now that this is kind of a clear procedure, you can also, of course, gauge the hypermultiplet scalars. And of course, you can do a combination of everything. Yes, The most general gauging and the most general gauge supergravity gauges everything, the gravitini, the vector multiplet scalars, and the hypermultiplet scalars. So here we have a kinetic term, which is something like, uh, well, how did I write it down yesterday? GU, or it's called HUV in the notation of some of our papers. Uh, D mu QU. So they're called QU u equals 1 to 4n. This is this quaternionic geometry. This is the metric on the quaternionic geometry. You again need same story as there. You need, uh, well, what shall we call it? Uh, um, well, you can use the same parameters, of course, because there's only one type of gauge field. So lambda, you can have killing vectors in the quaternionic geometry. And so call them q tilde. So these are killing vectors of HUV. And so then, of course, you do the same thing. You construct a covariant derivative, d mu q u, consisting of the ordinary derivative plus g a mu lambda and uh, k tilde lambda u, function of q. So they are the same vectors. We use the vector, we use the gauge fields from the vector multiplets to charge either the scalars that sits in their own in their own multiplet, or you use them to charge the scalars that sit in another multiplet. So this a mu and that a mu is just the same. There's only one set of gauge fields that are present. So then you have to adapt the supersymmetry transformation rules and um, um, to close the, or to make the algebra uh, closing, on shell here, we're on shell. And uh, once the supersymmetry transformation rules are modified, you have to start varying the action. You find it's not invariant unless you also add a potential. And the potential, I'm going to write it down, is a function of uh, Z, Z bar, and Q. I'm only doing electric gaugings here. And so here's G squared, G i j bar, K i lambda, K j bar uh, sigma, plus 4 H u v.
That's the last formula I will write down. So. Okay, let me, since it's, um, so um, let's say a few things about it. So in the previous case where I only had the, the R symmetry gaugings, there was no killing vectors here. So this, this term was not here. Hi, there were no hypermultiplets. This term was completely absent. This term was completely absent. The only thing that I had basically was this term and these P's were then the phi Heliopolis terms. Now, generically, these P's are called moment maps. I, I would need to tell a little bit of geometry to, to explain what moment maps are. Uh, but uh, in some sense, the simplest choice of these moment maps are setting them to a constant, uh, and those are then, uh, and th those are two vectors, uh, and, and you can rotate, put them in one direction, and th these are called the phi Heliopolis terms. So that reproduces the, um, reproduces the potential that I wrote down before. This term was absent, and this term was absent. You see there's a competition between positive terms and negative terms, because here, here we have the minus sign, so that allows for vacua, either de Sitter, anti de Sitter, Minkowski, there's a balancing between positive and negative terms, in contrast to supersymmetric field theories, where potentials are always positive. And so, um, well, that's it. So the, 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 the story here about this potential is that it's, it has a completely geometrical interpretation. It's a function of all the scalar fields, both in the vector multiplets and the hypermultiplets. Uh, and it's determined by geometrical data. The prepotential and the killer potential, it's killing vectors, so it's symmetries. Same for the hypermultiplets, it's the metric and, the, and it's killing vectors. These L's I wrote down before, it was e to the k over 2 times x, and x for this, this is all determined by the prepotential. Same story here, determined by the prepotential, and these are moment maps. Moment maps are basically constructed out of the, uh, out of, uh, the killing vectors on the hyperkähler um, space. So I'm not going to bother you with the details of these moment maps, but it's something explicitly constructed in terms of, killing, of these killing vectors. So then, uh, in principle, then you can start playing the same game. You can look for BPS, for BPS, uh, BPS black hole solution. Um, and uh, that story is very much going on. There's not too many examples uh, of black hole solution. Maybe there's even only one, I think where there's an analytic solution uh, known with, with uh, hypermultiplets uh, uh, present. And so that's still under development. I, uh, I'm also not up to date with the very latest, so people can inform me here uh, if I'm overlooking something. Um, clearly, uh, it's a, the, the story is to find more general black hole solutions just rather than just having that singular example I just found. Find a generic structure of the solutions, find the embedding in string theory or in M-theory. Uh, they must asymptote to ADS4. Well, we want them. That's, that's the, 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 the goal of this whole exercise because we want to explain the entropy of uh, black holes uh, using the dual field theory. Uh, which was su successfully done in the example that I showed in a paper by uh, Francesco, uh, Alberto, Kirill, uh, Christophe. So um, I think we're going to hear more about it in Alberto's lecture. So I will uh, stop here. The timing seems to be perfect. So thank you for attending. <laughs> <laughs>